Hello, Liberty. I am uh, delighted to be here with you with my wife, Karen. This is a uh, deeply humbling moment for us. And uh, would you join me in just thanking President Jerry Falwell, Jr. for his extraordinary leadership, his kindness, his friendship. I, uh, I'm deeply humbled by that, that gracious introduction. Also great to hear there's some Hoosiers in the room. Jerry and I have gotten to be friends over the last year, and I can tell you my respect for him is boundless, but he knows that the introduction I prefer is a little bit shorter. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. And I'm honored to be with all of you today, to have the opportunity to share some things from my heart about the times in which we live, uh, about who I am, about what we're fighting for in these challenging days, and, and what I believe each of us is called to do to respond in these moments. But first and foremost, let me apologize for being a little bit late. Uh, I was at breakfast uh, this morning, and uh, Senator Tim Kaine called to interrupt me five times. <laughs> To get that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for getting that joke. I worked on that all night. <laughs> but first, let me share with you, first and foremost, a little bit about who I am. I'm a, I'm a small town boy from southern Indiana. I grew up in a family. My grandfather immigrated to this country. My mom and dad built everything that matters. A family, uh, a small business, and a good name. I was raised in a family where it was church on Sunday morning, it was grace before dinner, but uh, maybe like some of you, in the course of my life as I grew up, I chose a different path. I didn't see much relevance for the faith that I'd been raised in, and I struck out on my own, on my own steam. But then somewhere along the way, I began to meet people when I was about your age, when I was in college. They seemed to have something. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Uh, I would later understand that it, uh, it was what I would just characterize as joy. There were people that I met who in good times or in bad times, they had, they had some strength that I knew in my heart I was missing. I started attending a small Christian fellowship group on the campus, uh, and uh, uh, I won't say that it was because there were a lot of attractive and available young ladies that went to the Christian fellowship group, but there it is. And I heard some clapping for that. There may be some men in the room that can relate. Is that all right? Anyway, I went to this, and then I decided somewhere along the way in my freshman year, I decided, you know what, even though I'd walked away from faith in my life, I said, you know, I, I was going to go ahead and be Christian. And this friend of mine, who actually now is a pastor in Indianapolis of a, of a church in, in our capital city and still a close friend to this day, who'd been talking to me about matters of faith. I remember stopping him one time. We'd had a few conversations about what the Bible had to say, and, and I told him, I said, he wore this nice cross I was very impressed with, and I, I told him I wanted to get that catalog that he got the cross in. This was before the day that you could order everything on your cell phone, right? In fact, it was before cell phones, to be quite honest with you. And I looked at him, and I'll never forget, we were in our fraternity in the cafeteria, and I said, hey, be sure and get me that catalog because I want to, you know, I want to get that cross. I'm going to start wearing a cross, you know, because I'm doing the Christian thing now. And he looked at me and he said, words I'll never forget. He said, Mike, you've got to wear it in your heart before you wear it around your neck. And it stopped me dead in my tracks. You ever had that happen to you in your life when somebody who knows you real well just calls you out? They can tell where you really are. He said, you've got to wear it in your heart before you wear it around your neck. It would be a few weeks later, I was in Wilmore, Kentucky at a Christian music festival. I listened to one sermon after another. And it was in that weekend, sitting in the pouring rain late on a Saturday night, that my heart broke, not with guilt but with gratitude, that what had happened on the cross had certainly happened for all the world, but I, I came to realize that what had happened on the cross had happened in some small way for me. And I made a personal decision to put my faith in Jesus Christ, and it's made all the difference. Well, 
Well, I followed a calling into public service. I graduated from that college. I'd be 29 years old, and the first time I'd run for public office, it'd take me about 12 years to find my way into the Congress of the United States. The dream of my life was to someday represent my hometown in our nation's capital, and I had the great privilege to do that. I served with Congressman Bob Goodlatte, who is really one of the great conservative leaders in the United States of America, a man who stands for the Constitution of this country like no other. Bob, stand up, take a bow, will you? You sure do deserve it. Congressman Bob Goodlatte, everybody. I served in the Congress of the United States for 12 years, and the opportunity came to serve the state that I love as governor. And I've been, I've been deeply humbled to be governor of the great state of Indiana over the last four years. As President Falwell said, it's a state that works. We demonstrate in Indiana you can cut taxes and balance budgets. You can invest in roads and bridges, in education and health care. And today we have more Hoosiers going to work than ever before in the 200-year history of the state of Indiana. But then this opportunity came into our lives, and it was extraordinary this summer when the phone rang. And um, you know, to know the Pences is to know a family. And we make decisions as a family. I walked out with her, but I'd appreciate it if you gave her a welcome. The second best decision I ever made in my life was the day that I asked Karen Whitaker to become my wife. Would you join me in welcoming the First Lady of the State of Indiana, Karen Pence? The call came this summer. The call came this summer asking us if we would consider being, uh, being looked at for, uh, for the position that we now enjoy, and I have to tell you, it's deeply humbling to me. I mean, I, I dreamed someday of representing my hometown in, in Washington, D.C., this grandson of an immigrant. I, uh, I can't, I'm still getting over the fact that I've been able to be governor of the state that I love, but I never, never imagined I'd be standing before all of you, having been invited to run and serve as the next Vice President of the United States of America. It's deeply humbling. I'll never forget the night that we got the call. We were told it might be coming, so we huddled with our kids. We talked through it, we prayed through it as a family, and we were ready for the call. And I'll never forget when the phone rang, 11 o'clock at night at the governor's residence, I picked up the phone and I heard that familiar voice, and he said, Mike. It's going to be great. <laughs> and it has been. And I want to tell you, I joined this campaign in a heartbeat because our party has nominated a man for president who never quits, who never backs down. He is a fighter. He is a winner. And I believe come November the 8th that Donald Trump will be elected the 45th president of the United States and we will make America great again. You know, he is uh, he's someone who I truly do believe, and I've said this many times, I mean, gotten to know him when the Klieg lights are off and the cameras are off. Donald, Donald Trump is someone who literally embodies the spirit of America, strong, freedom-loving, independent, optimistic, and willing to fight every day for what he believes in. You sure saw that on Sunday night when Donald Trump won the debate hands down. And America also saw something else on Sunday night. You know, it takes a big man to know when you're wrong, to admit it, to express remorse and apologize, and Donald Trump did just that. You know, I was asked on a television program the next morning how I, as a Christian, could move beyond those moments and accept an apology. And I was happy to explain that to the television host. I said, you know, as, as a believer, we're called, to, we're called to aspire to live godly lives. But also we recognize that we all fall short. And it's not about condoning what is said and done. It's about believing in grace and forgiveness. As Christians, we are called to forgive even as we've been forgiven. And I would submit to you last Sunday night, my running mate showed humility. He showed what was in his heart to the American people. And then he fought back and turned the focus to the choice that we face, and it's a more dramatic choice than any time in any election in my lifetime. 
It truly is. And that's what I want to speak to you about today, the choice that we face and the duty that we have in the midst of this choice. Because I truly do believe that this election is not just a choice between two people. It's really a choice between two futures. And let me be clear, at the outset of this convocation, for me, for my family, we choose a stronger America. We choose a more prosperous America. We choose an America that upholds our highest constitutional traditions, and so we choose to stand with Donald Trump and every American who believes we can make America great again. And it's a choice I, I want to say to each one of you that I, I believe that, uh, that men and women of faith cannot choose to stand idly by in this great national debate. You know, during my years in Congress, I befriended the late and great Chuck Colson. He would become not only my friend, but a mentor to me. Chuck Colson wrote an extraordinary book, Kingdoms in Conflict, that I commend to your attention. But he, he essentially wrote in his book that as believers, we are commanded to be active participants in the governance of our nation. As Colson wrote, Christians must not adopt the, quote, simply passing through mindset when it comes to politics. So how do we do that? Well, thankfully, the good book has a lot to say about how we balance the pulpit with politics. First and foremost is that we're called to pray for our nation's leaders, even those we disagree with. And we encourage you to do that each and every day, particularly in the next four weeks. And as people of faith, we're also called to respect the governing authorities that are placed over us. And we should do that and respect the institutions of our governors. But nowhere does it teach in the Bible that we are to sit on the sidelines of history. And this is no time for the people of faith to sit on the sidelines. In his famous Evil Empire speech in Orlando, Florida, President Ronald Reagan actually said in an address delivered to the National Association of Evangelicals these words. He said, quote, I urge you to beware the temptation of pride, the temptation of blithely declaring yourselves above it all, and label both sides equally at fault, close quote. Let me say that to you again. President Reagan warned in his day, a warning that people of faith might do well to reflect on today, that we should beware the temptation to blithely declare ourselves above it all and label both sides equally at fault. His admonition to the people of faith to avoid the trap of inaction is as relevant today as it was then, maybe even more so. You know, we woke up this morning in the news, you might see when you get back to your dorm room, that our opponent's uh, campaign, a campaign whose candidate actually called millions of Americans a basket of deplorables, irredeemable and not American, simply because they stand with me and my running mate and believe that we can have a stronger, more prosperous America that's grounded in our constitutional principles. And it was this morning that we learned from another email release, if you haven't heard about it yet, that a campaign official in her campaign back in 2011 actually said that conservatives chose the Catholic faith because they, quote, think it is the most socially acceptable, politically conservative religion. And she added in her email, their rich friends wouldn't understand if they became evangelicals. It's extraordinary. If only on behalf of her Catholic running mate, Hillary Clinton should denounce those bigoted, anti-Catholic, anti-evangelical remarks, and her campaign staff should apologize to people of faith and do it now. In this time of condescension and at times overt hostility to people of faith, we fall into the temptation to recoil and retreat, but the stakes are too high. 
And I would say as fellow Christian believers that we have a different obligation. It would be the English Christian theologian John Stott who wrote memorably, quote, Christian salt has no business to remain snugly in elegant little ecclesiastic salt salters. He said, when society goes bad, one can hardly blame society. The real question is, where's the salt? When the annals of this time of American history are written, the question will be, where were you? Where were we in the great battle for life and liberty and freedom in America? What did you do? Not what did you think. What did we do, not what did we think that placed us on the right side of history? Men and women of faith, I will tell you, this is a time for action, not essays. And we must roll our sleeves up and be prepared to fight every day for what we believe in. Shortcomings are no excuse for inaction. If we were perfect, in a word, we wouldn't need Jesus. If we're far from perfect, we do need Him. But God's love eclipses our failings and has always renewed the strength of so many in this nation. This is a time I would submit to you for faith and courage. C.S. Lewis said that courage, courage is not simply one of the virtues. It is the form of every virtue at the testing point. Well, I would submit to each and every one of you and any people of faith that might be looking on across this state and nation that we are at a testing point that we are at a time in the life of our nation when, when those who cherish faith, those who cherish freedom, those who cherish the sanctity of life and all the liberties enshrined in our Constitution must be wary of being sidelined now. Those of a different agenda would hope that apathy would reign supreme on Election Day, but they were disappointed in 1980, and they are going to be disappointed again on November 8, 2016, because this choice could not be more clear. And the choice could not be more clear. It is a choice in security and prosperity and in the highest court in the land. And let me leave you with just a few thoughts about the magnitude of that choice. First, in the matter of security, seven and a half years of foreign policy directed by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton has weakened America's place in the world and emboldened the enemies of freedom. Despite traveling millions of miles as our Secretary of State, the world is more dangerous today than the day that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama took over guiding America's place in the world. Our allies are less secure, our enemies are more emboldened. We see the rise of ISIS terrorism trampling hard-won gains in Iraq. We see a wider Middle East literally spinning out of control. We see Russia, the so-called reset with Russia having collapsed into new Russian aggression. China building islands in the South China Sea in an increasingly aggressive North Korea. And in case after case, we see evidence of that great truth of history, that weakness arouses evil. And the truth is that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama's foreign policy of leading from behind, moving red lines, feigning resets with Russia, the rise, rule, and reign of ISIS are all a testament to that truth of history. The simple truth of the matter is we cannot have four more years apologizing to our enemies and abandoning our friends. For the world to be safe, America needs to be strong. And we need new and strong American leadership that reflects on the failings of the recent past. And they are not failings of an administration, it's important to note that Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, initiated that disastrous agreement with the radical mullahs in Iran. And when Bob Goodlatte and I were working on the initial economic sanctions against Iran, it was that we had one objective, that we would have, we would have punitive economic sanctions, the toughest in American history, on Iran until they permanently abandoned their nuclear ambitions. Under this administration, a deal was struck where 
the radical mullahs in Iran received $150 billion from the American people and only a commitment to delay their nuclear ambitions. The leading state sponsor of terrorism in the world is now literally on a pathway to obtaining a nuclear weapon. And worst of it all, on the very day that four American hostages were released from Tehran, this administration, with the full assent of Hillary Clinton and her running mate, delivered $400 million in cash on a wooden pallet as a ransom payment to that terror-sponsoring regime. Let me make you a promise that when Donald Trump becomes President of the United States, we won't be paying ransom to terrorist-sponsoring states. They'll be paying a price. They'll be paying a price if they threaten or detain or harm the people of this nation. Also, it was, it was Hillary Clinton. It was Hillary Clinton who failed to renegotiate what's called a status of forces agreement in Iraq. You know, I remember those hard days from Congress where we saw the American soldier fight through 2005, 2006, difficult days at enormous sacrifice. But because we had a president who would not give up, because we had soldiers who would not relent, the peace and stability of Iraq was secured by the end of 2008. The American soldier won, won stability and won security in Iraq. But this administration squandered that. By pulling all of the American forces out of Iraq at the end of 2012, they literally created the vacuum in which ISIS was able to overrun vast areas that had been hard won by the American soldier. It was heartbreaking, heartbreaking to see that happen. Those of us who had not only cheered on our war fighters, but also those that had stood quietly at the graveside with families of our fallen. And lastly, it was Hillary Clinton and her State Department who left Americans in harm's way in Benghazi. And after four Americans fell, Hillary Clinton would tell the parents would tell the parents of uh, those families of the fallen that it had to do with a filmmaker in Florida. When a congressional investigation found out that she knew full well that it was, in her words, a terrorist-style Al-Qaeda attack. Well, I want to tell you, when she was, went before the Senate, she, she actually said, when she was confronted on the truth, she said, quote, what difference at this point does it make? Well, men and women, I want to, I want to tell you from my heart, as the proud father of a United States Marine, Anybody who said that, anybody who did that, should be disqualified from ever serving as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States of America. I said we cannot have four more years apologizing to our enemies or abandoning our friends. And chief among those friends is the nation I call our most cherished ally. And I will promise you, the day that Donald Trump and I assume the office of President and Vice President, if the world knows nothing else, the world will know this, America stands with Israel. In these uncertain times on the world stage, the answer is American strength. President Ronald Reagan said that we would achieve peace through strength. And in the days ahead, I promise you, a President Donald Trump will lead on the world stage with American strength. We will rebuild our military. We will restore the arsenal of democracy. We will give our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines the resources and the training they need to accomplish their mission, protect our families, and come home safe to theirs. We will stand tall in the world again, and America and the world will be safer as a result. 
It's not just about security. The choice in this election, men and women, is also about prosperity. We stand in the midst of the weakest economic recovery since the Great Depression. Millions more Americans today find themselves living in poverty than the day that Barack Obama became president of the United States. We have the lowest labor participation rate in this nation. And I would tell you, I'm, I'm here with my daughter Charlotte, who just graduated from college. But, you know, we, we heard not long ago that, that Hillary Clinton and her campaign actually demeaned her primary opponent's supporters, referring to them as college graduates who moved home to their parents' basements. The truth is, this is an economy that's created too few opportunities for the rising generation. Hillary Clinton's answer is more of the same. Not just the same, but more of the same. More taxes, more regulation, more Obamacare, more of the war on coal, more of all the policies that have been stifling the American economy. You know, they tell us this economy is the best that we can do, but we know different. It's not the best that we can do. It's just the best they can do. And when Donald Trump becomes president of the United States of America, we're going to get this economy moving again. We're going to open doors of opportunities and create jobs all across Virginia and all across the United States of America. We're going to do it the way President Ronald Reagan did it back in the 1980s, and frankly, we're going to do it the way President John F. Kennedy did in the 1960s. Instead of raising taxes, as Hillary Clinton plans, more than a trillion dollars in tax increases, Donald Trump and I are going to work with this renewed Congress, this reelected Congress. We're going to cut taxes across the board for working families, small businesses, and family farms. We're going to end death taxes once and for all, and we're going to lower business taxes in America so businesses can create jobs here in Virginia instead of shipping them overseas. And because regulations are stifling jobs and American growth, we're going to have a moratorium on any new federal regulation on day one of this administration, and Donald Trump will repeal every single Obama executive order that is stifling jobs and opportunities all across this nation. And Donald Trump and I believe that trade means jobs, but when Donald Trump becomes negotiator in chief. We're going to have trade deals that put the American worker first. Trade is going to mean American jobs. We're going to renegotiate NAFTA. We're going to get out of the TPP, and we're going to hold our trading partners accountable to the promises that they make to the American people to support our prosperity and our opportunity. And on the first day of this administration, I promise you, the war on coal is going to come to a crashing halt. We're going to develop an all-of-the-above energy strategy that develops all of the God-given resources of this land, and it will fuel an American comeback with low-cost and diverse American energy. And probably the... And Bob, I don't want to put this on you, but we do know that Congress convenes before the President is inaugurated. So if you can go ahead and pass this bill and put it on the President-elect's desk, we're going to repeal Obamacare lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> Former President Bill Clinton finally said something I can agree with. Did you hear about it? He actually called Obamacare, quote, the craziest thing in the world. You know, sometimes even with the Clintons, the truth happens.
I mean, I remember when we were debating health care reform, the idea was to lower the cost of health insurance. All they did was grow the size of government. Premiums have gone up, benefits have gone down, and we're going to do better, men and women. Under a Trump-Pence administration, we're going to work with this Congress. We're going to pass the kind of health care reform that lowers the cost of health insurance, expands choice and opportunity, respects the doctor-patient relationship, and does it all on a foundation of free market economics and freedom that will drive the American economy and meet our health care needs. So the choice in this election is dramatic. It's about the security of our nation. It's about the prosperity of this generation and the next. But perhaps most significantly, it has to do with who we are as a people. You know, the, um, it seems like there's no aspect of our lives too small for this present administration to supervise. No provision of the Constitution too large for them to ignore. While we talk about security, while we talk about prosperity, make no mistake about it. Life and liberty and the Constitution itself are on the ballot come November the 8th, and we need to think long and hard about that. You know, people who know me well know I'm pro-life, and I don't apologize for it. I believe a society can be judged by how it deals with its most vulnerable, the aged, the infirm, the disabled, and the unborn. I long to see the day that Roe versus Wade is consigned to the ash heap of history where it belongs, and we again embrace a culture of life in America. And I promise you, different from the agenda of our opposition, of abortion on demand, including partial birth abortion and public funding of abortion, Donald Trump and I will work to advance the sanctity of life in the rule of law. We will sign a bill banning late-term abortions, and we will uphold the historic Hyde Amendment to prevent the use of taxpayer dollars to fund that which millions of Americans find to be morally objectionable. And Donald Trump and I believe that the largest abortion provider in America should not be the largest recipient of federal funding under Title X. A Trump-Pence administration will defund Planned Parenthood and redirect those dollars to women's health care that doesn't provide abortion services. We can make America great again by honoring the sanctity of every human life and supporting the health and well-being of women across this country. But let me leave you with one more reminder, if I can. This rising generation of extraordinary young men and women here at Liberty University and the incredible faculty that serves you with such distinction. Would you give them a round of applause? Eh? As we talk about security, as we talk about prosperity, as we talk about the sanctity of life, I want to remind all of you, though, that while we're going to be voting to elect a president for the next four years, come November the 8th, that president will likely set the course and direction of the Supreme Court of the United States for the next 40 years. We better think long and hard about that. If you cherish the Constitution, the principles of limited government that are enshrined there, you better think long and hard. Elect Hillary Clinton, you better get used to being subject to more unelected judges using unaccountable power to make unconstitutional actions. But elect Donald Trump, 
as the next president of the United States, and we will appoint justices to the Supreme Court and every court in the land who will strictly uphold the Constitution of the United States of America and stand up for the God-given liberties that are enshrined there. So let me say, for the sake of the rule of law, for the sake of the sanctity of life, for the sake of the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, for the sake of all of our God-given liberties, we must decide here and now in the great Commonwealth of Virginia that the next president to make appointments to the Supreme Court of the United States will be President Donald Trump. So these are challenging times, and I'm deeply humbled to have the opportunity to speak before you today. I truly am. But I want to tell you, we, we said yes the night that call came because I think this country's in a lot of trouble. I walked away from a job that I love and the state that I love to step into this fight because I think now is the time for all of us to do all that we can because that choice is so clear. And I'm really here today not really to give a, a speech. I'm, I'm here to challenge you, challenge you in what remains of this election to take ownership of your own future, take ownership of this moment, and understand that there, there's no place for believers on the sidelines in a time like this. As Chuck Colson said, as C.S. Lewis said, this is a time for courage. It's a time to step forward. A friend of mine sent me an email just this morning. He talked about a day where he was on a 25-foot boat out in the middle of the Atlantic, and he was at the helm of that little sailing boat, and the tempest was blowing right in his face, and he wanted for 